back to Tactics Talk. It's me, Guido, and we got a coffee talk for Easter morning. So happy Easter, or if that is not your thing, happy Sunday. But either way, I have my coffee. You can see it's got the, what is that? Empire State Building. I don't know why that escaped my mind, but it did. It's actually written on the back, so I probably could have clued myself in. <laughs> so I've got my Empire State Building mug that I got when I was in New York on the trip, because you got to do the tourist thing. Not bad, I've got some community coffee dark roast. So some decent cheap dark for my Keurig. But I still haven't got into roasting my own, not roasting, but percolating my own coffee. I'm just too lazy at this point. But anyway, we are going to talk about multiple things today. We've got a good lineup for today. Interesting missions and sales going on. A little foreshadowing, you can see a tank sitting there in my garage. Wargaming recently put out a questionnaire, and I've got a few things to talk about about that. I'm sure you saw that thing, and I don't know if those things drive you as crazy as they drive me, but we'll talk about a few of the goofy things that went on there. We are going to talk about the current contest scandal. Good job, Wargaming. <laughs> and the last thing we've got is there's a GDC interview with Victor Kiesley, and it was in, I think it's called Venture, Venture Capital or something like that. I'll talk about the website when we get there. It wasn't really picked up by any of the usual blogs. And it was more of a discussion between a, a business discussion at GDC Vice, just a game discussion. So I thought there were some interesting things that came out of that. We're going to take a look at that, which may help explain some of the things that happen in this game and have happened recently as far as the way they manage the game and develop it. So let's get started. Grab your coffee. My cup is long and... Uh, well, it's like the Empire State Building. You thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? All right, let's get started. Okay, as usual, we'll start with the events and missions. So we go to the events tab. You can see the 1.0 map out is still going on all the way up to April 6th. So we still have, what, five days of this or four, really, of play. Maybe, I guess, five counting today. Anyway, all that math in public, what does it mean? We can get the MTLS. We get a garage slot with it, and we only have to get 100 stamps or only need 100 stamps to do it. We'll talk about tokens and stamps you see that they're called stamps some places and they're called tokens <laughs> oh man anyway it only took a hundred whatever they are to get yourself the mtls i would imagine most people have it by now the other cool thing about it is the first time you win or lose on a map and your top 10 experience then you end up with two stamp token things and ten thousand silver the second time it goes down to as we get down here dun, dun, dun. Well, I guess it's not listed because I haven't done a second time any of them yet. Anyway, the second time, it's 5,000. And you get a bonus multiplier here for combat experience, for regular experience. So it is all around a great little way to celebrate 1.0 coming out. Get a cool little Tier 3 tank. I've played it once or twice. It, it's not very good. I say cool because it's a free premium, whatever. Um, tier 3, who cares? But... In this case, it's the thought that counts, and it was set up pretty nicely. So I did enjoy the map out thing. And you should be making some pretty good good coins, especially if you're running premium and a premium tank. Add another five or 10000 on top, and it would really help people who don't have premium accounts because that's down in you know, five, tier 5, tier 6, tier 7. If you lose money on those because you had to fling some gold, it's probably in the five to 10000 regime. So more than likely, it's either neutralizing or helping them make a little more money. The 268 is on track. You know my feelings about on tracks. Pretty good deals if that's the line that you're going up. And can help you plan out your lines as you're going up as well. Tech Master, we've got two sets of those as usual. You get those cool little M's to put on the side of your tank and show everybody you're the master of the tank, whatever it is. And then we've got Supply Raid for the weekend. Also, Double Crew XP today. I think it's through today. Yeah, there you go. 23 hours left. So this weekend is what it was for, which is always nice. A double crew weekend is very good, especially once every battle. It is top 10 and you have to win. So scratch that. Not every battle, but every battle that you win and you're in the top 10. That's important. The whole win thing. We're going to discuss that in regards to 
the shenanigans that are going on later on in the coffee talk. And that is it for the events and the mission. So we shall move on. All right, so here's an example of what they do that drives me crazy with their UI and their missions. I talked about the stamps thing a little bit earlier. So here we have, this is for the mission, for the map out. We have one section, this is a couple different pieces of it, but all the different places where they talk about stamps. We have stamps, stamps are earned. We have a stamp token. We have the stamp capitalized, different color bolded token. And we have the collect tokens. Is it a stamp? Is it a token? Is it a stamp token? Or is it a stamp token? I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Is that a little thing? Did it change anything that I did in the game? Did it make me leave the game? Did it uh, lose them millions of dollars? No. Is it just irritating and unnecessary at this point? Absolutely. Uh, just a little QA would, would sort all that out. But... For me, it's just more proof that they don't really play the game. They build it. They have their different departments. It's a big company, and they churn stuff out, and nobody really worries too much about whether it's coordinated properly, and that will be important to a discussion a little while later. And last but not least, in the last part of the stamp token, stamp token, stamp token controversy, in map out, we also have a secret sign token. I don't know what this is. I think it's just a mistake, an artifact, maybe an incorrect callback, whatever they're doing right there with their coding. Unsure if there's actually some kind of thing you're going to get by having a secret sign token. I have received a number of these. I cannot figure out the rhyme or reason to why they show up. They seem relatively random. Sometimes it's on the first time you do it on a map. Sometimes it's on the second time you do it on the map. There doesn't seem to be anything that I can see. There are some discussions on the forum about it. Nobody seems to have a really good idea of what it is. Personally, I think it's nothing. It's just a mistake of some kind. But it goes back to what I just talked about, about the token, stamp token. Is it a token? Is it a stamp? Is it a secret sign token? <laughs> Does anybody remember if secret sign was used in the past for another, another contest? That might be it. But it's just the same thing. What is this? Now, if it comes out to where at the end of this thing, secret sign count comes out and we get something for getting secret sign tokens, eh, maybe that's a little bit interesting. We'll find out when the mission is over. But I haven't found a counter anyway, anywhere for it in the UI or any discussion about it at all on the website. So stay tuned for that. Personally, I think it's nothing. It's just a mistake, but who knows. First things first on the sales while we get our shill on is that the secret tank that's only 24 hours that they've been crowing about for a while happens to be the 1357. <laughs> I think that's probably a little bit of a dis disappointment and it might have been overhyped a little bit. It is a cool little scout tank, little tier 7 French. I think people, based on the hype that it was given, thought it might be something very interesting. The standard words of once in a lifetime and You'll never see it again. All that garbage was said again, although the write-up's not too bad up here about that. The one thing you need to know about it, which is actually kind of cool if you don't have it and you're still spending money, it does not have the Grand Finals paint scheme on it. You hear that? It does not have the Grand Finals paint schemes, which means you can probably, not probably, you can put your own camo, which would be cool. I would love to put my own camo on my little dude, which you saw in the, the garage right there because I'm running around with the wargaming.net grand finals paint scheme but in any event it comes in packages in the whole nine yards only for the next 23 four hours whatever it is that brings us to the other sales which there are some other pretty decent tanks out there i won't really comment on the sales you can see the minus percentage depending on which package you go with or just buy the tank but the tiger 131 is in the shop the tog 2 which is a really fun tank gets a lot of hate I love it. I, lo I love playing that thing. When it first came out, I played it a lot. It has been power creeped a little bit, even at tier six. It does struggle a little bit on some of the, the larger maps based on its speed. However, overall, it really is just a lot of fun to play. And isn't that why we're doing this? Is it the most dominant tank ever? No. Uh, I think at one point I was number three on the server in this thing. But it's been a long time since I played it. However, if you're looking for just a goofy, fun tank, 
th this is it. It really, really is. The 1357 is still out, and the Suma is still out there as well. So actually some fairly interesting tanks. The 131 is kind of an HT6 131, and there's one other, there's one other clone. Can't remember what it is, but it's a great tank at tier six for a heavy, just a stock Tiger one with the short 88, and it really acquits itself well at tier six. That's pretty much it for the sales and specials. April Fools, it's not all for the sales and special. <laughs> all right, so we've got the just enough. All right, this is interesting because it's been out for a while. I'm not sure if I mentioned this last week, and maybe I did, but this is the kind of thing that drives me crazy with their advertising. Get just enough to help win the battle. Okay, guys. <laughs> if you're trying to avoid the pay to win label, you don't say things like, hey, buy this and add win into it. As in, if you, the connotation is if you buy this stuff, some gold, some silver, and some premium time, then hey, it's going to help you win. Maybe in a roundabout way as a secondary or tertiary thing where you can maybe upgrade your tank because you were struggling with credits. Or if you're going directly, you could say, I'm going to use the gold to shoot gold rounds, which nobody does because you can shoot it for silver. But the connotation is bad. And somebody, anybody at Wargaming should have been able to look at that immediately and go, yeah, let's not say it that way. Let's, let's say this something else. Might be a good deal. I, I don't know. I don't buy. I never purchase anything that's giving me credits, silver credits, because that just buying silver credits, I, you don't need to. But if you've got the money and want to, fine. So it may be overall, if you do the math, a pretty good deal. And it probably is for, for seven days of premium and a little bit of gold just to kind of get you started. But usually that's advertised as, hey, here's a starter pack or get yourself started or move on the way or something. But <laughs> when you add the whole, I mean, a new player comes in and he looks at this and he goes, oh, just enough to help win. Well, hell, I've been losing like crazy. Let's buy this baby and maybe I'll do some winning. <laughs> oh, man. I don't get it. I really don't. Let's move on. All right, in the last week or so, there was a questionnaire that popped up when you logged in, which I think is a good way for them to do that kind of thing. Put it right in the client, let people just answer the questions. Usually they're not too long. And I think that's great. You gotta you gotta get some feedback with, with your product, and that's one great way to do it. If you can build it into your own UI and it doesn't become a big hassle for people, then they're more likely to answer it and give you a little feedback. But the questions I find are sometimes kind of strange. And this one <laughs> in particular, in update 1.0, the Overlord map, which was previously removed, when was it previously removed? Was added. What? In general, do you like the idea of returning the Overlord map to the game? Now, I've been around a long time, and the Overlord map came. I don't remember it being removed, nor do I remember it being added. And as far as the idea of returning a map that I don't think was ever removed or returned, I, I, I'm pretty sure I picked a not sure. <laughs> um, I don't know. Tell me if I'm wrong. Was it removed and added back at some point in the distant past? All right, so we move on to this one. Wow, that's a laundry list. This is, since update 1.0, what technical problems have prevented you from playing World of Tanks comfortably? That's a lot of stuff. It is it is my contention that this patch wasn't quite ready, not from a QC or QA standpoint. I don't think uh, a lot of companies probably would not have allowed it to be released in the state that it's in. I'm not saying it's a disaster, but a lot of people are having a lot of weird little problems. And when you get into things like incorrect display of objects and textures, that's just a lack of time for testing. And they've, a lot of different things are happening. Uh, game clients closing spontaneously, constantly freezes. To be fair, they just put out a, a micro patch, and I think it fixed some of this stuff. But it's interesting that they've got a questionnaire with that large a laundry list of sp very specific things that aren't working for people. <laughs> Now, there's a couple of things that I thought, and I didn't take pictures of them. I wish I had. I was almost done with it before I started thinking about I should take photos or screens of these things and show them to you. But they asked about several of the, of the maps. Unfortunately, it was only about Overlord, which I don't, that whole thing, I don't understand what they're talking about. One other map, oh, Cliff. They asked about Cliff. 
hey, how's Cliff? You know, is it easy to move through some other things? I, Cliff is fine. I haven't had any issues with Cliff. What they didn't ask about was the maps that were horrendously bad. Well, let's start with the worst, Glacier, the new one. My God, what is with that map? The giant pit of doom in the middle that no one wants to go to because you get wrecked. The giant ramp of doom, the trying to get up to the top of a frozen aircraft carrier. I mean, which one of these things is not like the other? Other than the big Zeppelin that they dropped on, I think it's Redshire, which is ridiculous and is entire purpose is to stop Artie from hitting people fighting there. Come on, man. Other than that, I don't remember any of their maps that have these kind of ridiculous things on them. And a, a bunch of frozen ships and an aircraft carrier that you can go up and fight on. I mean, that's just cartoon stuff. I get it. This is kind of a cartoon. It's not a simulator. But I think that's a step too far, in my opinion. I'm sure a lot of people love it. But let's just say that's all fine and talk about the design of the map, which is a giant pit in the middle. A ramp which is completely exposed, kind of like mines, where you've got to run up there with your lights and mediums, usually get wrecked one side or the other completely. And then you've got the fights around the complete rim of the of the map. You're, ah, it's a mess. It is just a mess. They have got to quit making pits where dumb people go into them and get crushed. Giant pits as far as map design, are horrendously bad, especially when they're in the very middle of the of the map. <laughs> so that's Glacier. And then how about Fjords? What happened to Fjords? The middle is a joke. The <laughs> it's not, I don't even know where to start with Fjords. The, I don't understand what they were getting at in the middle. The middle looks a little bit now like Malinovka, where you got two, ridge, two tree lines to snipe at each other, but affords probably even less ability for anyone to push across it than Alanovkin does because it's closer. <laughs> Fjords, is, Fjords is awful. It, it's it's bad. Uh, the next one, Erlenberg. Come on. What on? Who <laughs> who thought that was a good idea? That, on that one, they seem to have decided to make the middle of the fight, but nobody wants to go there because even though it's pretty protected, there's still a bunch of crossfire opportunities for all the people who camp and snipe. And they're going to be up in the castle, or up on the ridges, or sitting back of the cap, oh, by the way, which has all kinds of cover for snipers to just sit there and never move, and a whole bunch of open killing ground to get across to them. Erlenberg, wow, it was pretty good map. I actually liked Erlenberg a lot. You could get up under them, you could push into them, you could do all kinds of things on Erlenberg. It really had a place for every tank. I don't even know what they were thinking on Erlenberg, so it, it's not good. The last, so the last question of the questionnaire was, what is your age? What is your age? What on earth does that have to do with anything? I mean, come on, my age? So now you can classify people's answers by age and then discount a certain, oh, they're, you know, old people, they don't know, the young kids, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, old people don't like the, don't like the, the new map glacier, but all our young people love it. I mean, I, I don't get it. I don't get it, man. Let's move on. Hey, it's a bonus. It's the April Fool's Day, Easter Day. Isn't that weird that they're both on the same day? I didn't really think about it until I woke up today. <laughs> I just thought of something. Maybe it's sacrilegious, but <laughs> what if Jesus just came out of the cave? He's like, April Fool's. I'm not really dead. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, man. It's just that just came to my mind. I don't know. I'm probably not the first guy to think about that today. <laughs> anyway, speaking of April Fools, the gag has been revealed. Oh, you or gaming, you got us. We were so certain that you were going to do something called Grand Battle Royale. Well, actually, actually, uh, quite a few of the blogs I think sort of thought that was going to happen. Now everyone understood April first was coming up, so that discussion was in there. So it's a weird thing about this, actually, because it's it's not exactly an April Fool's gag, because you can play the mode. Go down to the Sandbox test server, which if you click that, it will take you to the load. It's about 7 gig. It tells you all the information right here. Be warned, it's, a, it's not quite stable. It's not a finished product. So 64-bit systems are going to work better than 32-bit systems. You can read all the details there. But it's just a basic 
everyone v everybody kind of battle. So I mean, if you're interested in checking that out, it's right there. It's going to be a seven gig download, so it's going to take you a while to do that. It's on a separate server, so you can't do it through your normal UI. You've got to load the test server and log in and all that good stuff. But there you go. Interesting. Um, seems like a lot of time to spend on something that you really don't have any intention. This is probably a test balloon just to see what happens when, when a bunch of players play it. They are discussing that they're more interested in fine-tuning 1.0 in the core engine than really worrying about a new game mode. But this is what companies do. They float big ideas like this. They have spent time on it, obviously, development time and money. So I doubt it was just built for just built for April Fools, but they've built little weird modes before and then and then shit can them eight bit racing things like that. Who knows? It's kind of interesting. Check it out. Okay, Grand Extravaganza 1.0. This is the controversy I said we would talk about. I call it a scandal. It's not it's not really a scandal. First of all, it's it has to do with the map out and rolling out 1.0. So that that whole map out thing was fantastic. We talked about the MTLS, all the good things you can get. Super regionals is the thing I talked about last week where your region competes to get X number of stamps and at each level, each break point that they've got listed on it, you get something. We've hit the first two, I think, in NA. I think it's pretty easy we're gonna get the third one. I'm not certain we're gonna get to the fourth one based on the rate that we are getting stamps, but we'll see. The key though, the, the problem is this trophy leaderboard. I'm, I'd imagine a lot of you are aware of it. So we're going to flip over to this thing because here it is. When you click that button, you'll be taken to this spot. There's where we are right now on the way to the next thing, which is camo. That would be cool to get. That's for the super regionals. But this is what I want to talk about here, which is the Intel leaderboard. So they're going to give away, and I talked about last week, but I didn't really put two and two together being slower than most. Some people saw it right off the bat. I just assume people try to game these things anyway, so it's, I'm not surprised, but I didn't really think about it enough to, to figure out what was going to happen, but here's what's happening. <laughs> All right, see this loser and its rocket, these two guys at 2,964 and 2,900, really these guys for that matter down here in the 2000s and, and maybe even down to these dudes, but these guys are probably sleeping. Loser, you can do the math, it's how for how long this thing's been running, but essentially what the math comes down to is he's getting a stamp token, token stamp, stamp token, secret token, what, <laughs> secret stamp, whatever they are, about every two to three minutes, 24 seven, four, five or six days now. If you go over to, if you go over to the European server, I wanna say there are even more. And I think also that this one has been locked I don't know if this one's moving anymore because I did read something about that. But when you did the math at the point that he got to here, that's what it was, about a stamp every three minutes. And what's happening because people, I think Rocket is actually, it's Rocket is actually streaming on occasion. They are raging in like a tier three, tier two, tier three tank, straightforward, shooting as they go, ram somebody if they can, because it is top 10 win or lose. And it's pretty easy to get top 10 win or lose if you just rage out, get some spots, shoot a couple guys, and ram them for some damage. Or just fight for 30 seconds and die. Just get forward, blast as much as you can. doesn't matter if you win or lose or die. And boom, you're right on to the next tank. So that whole thing has incentivized that kind of gameplay. Okay, that kind of gameplay is not necessarily, in my mind, illegal. It's dopey. It's not good for the game. It's not good for showing the new players down at level down at tier three. It screws over your team, kind of screws over the enemy team because if you rage forward to one poor guy and unload everything at him and ram him, he's down to you know whatever percentage of hit points for the game even starts. And noted, it's a game about shooting each other. And really, at the end of the day, we can't tell someone that they can't play that way. That's just a way to play. It's dopey. It's not good for the game, like I said. However, the the key here is is. Are, are these guys actually playing that much 24-7? Is it one guy? Are they not sharing the account? Is there a rotation of people going through this account? Should be easy to match the IP if it's moving around. Maybe not necessarily if they're smart enough to mask it. Uh, I'm not smart enough to even think of how that would work exactly, but I'm sure it's technically possible to make it look like it's the same IP. I could be wrong. 
But let's say it's the same IP. That it's the same computer. They never change it, but it's different people. Obviously, those are legal things. How would you prove that? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think you have a legal leg to stand on if you're wargaming unless there's some kind of video evidence or IP address chicanery going on. Otherwise, someone's going to get their $3,000 i7 for sharing an account and 24-7 for however many days of the week this thing went on, uh, YOLO ramming people and just playing like an idiot. I mean, the whole thing was pretty cool right up to we got to this. And I think if you're wargaming and you have players who understand the game a little bit, I think you should have been able to see this coming. I really do. I didn't think about it too much when it came up because I wasn't really looking for stuff, but I'm not, I'm not running the game and trying to keep my game clean and keep this kind of thing out of it. In addition, what I did talk about last week is I think now you've got Intel and Alienware's names associated with this. <laughs> and that's, I'm telling you, from a business standpoint, that is a great big bummer right now for Wargaming. They are probably looking at that going, well, that did not work. <laughs> What will be interesting is to see what happens. Do these guys get the tanks? Or not the tanks, but the the laptop and the processors? Do they disqualify them? Do they try to sweep it under the rug? Like I said, I think some of these leaderboards have been frozen. In fact, I, I think that's the same number I saw a day or two ago, so I don't know if it's been updated or they're frozen. So uh, we may have another memory hole situation where stuff is going to be swept under the rug. We'll find out. I mean, there's a lot of money involved here. You're talking about Wargaming, a multi-million, is it a billion dollar company? I don't know. A big company as far as a computer gaming development company goes. Obviously, Alienware slash Dell and Intel are massive companies. So they don't really take kindly to that kind of stuff going on, on a, from a business standpoint. So it'll be interesting to see what happens on that. All right, so let's move on to the interview. All right, here's the article, and it is on a site called Venture... Where is it? VentureBeat. VentureBeat.com. And it's Victor talking to somebody about 1.0 and time to revamp Wargaming. And I think this has a lot to do with the move from California to Texas as well. And it starts off with the guy writing says he enjoys kidding, kidding him about why it takes so many people. 4,500 employees in so many years to get to version 1.0. 4,500 employees. Wow, that's a, that is a lot for a game designer who is essentially running on one game with a couple side things going on which are not nearly as successful at this point may have a lot to do with why they're cutting back on a lot of things that they're doing there so that I thought that was interesting so we'll move down so he spends a lot of time initially asking questions about the new version and Victor talking about all the development that it took the things they did turning the engine into a world-class kind of first world top tier engine the whole Encore thing, building their own engine, yada, yada. And it got kind of interesting here because on this portion he says, this is Victor, PC gaming is back, let's put it like that. People buy Dells and Razors and Alienwares and spend 2000 on a rig to play extremely high fidelity games. Now World Tanks is one of those games. It's in the top tier. He says, Henry Ford once said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, I would have made a faster horse. That's very interesting because I that really gets into the the mindset of this company. Sometimes that's the whole point of innovation. We didn't get many requests for a touchscreen version either. As a company, you have to do things that aren't necessarily the result of user polls. Okay? You just do it, and then everyone says, wow, we've been running for two days in Russia, which is a very critical region for gaming. They love it, the media love it, but most importantly, the players love it. That mindset is is endemic to their to the company and it is interesting and while on the surface of it I agree with a portion of it that sometimes in innovation you need to just push forward with what you're doing at the same time you got to create something that people want and in the case of 1.0 I think you can easily say people want it to look nice I think that's just basic for any kind of game experience and it needs to look nice did it need to look a ton nicer than it did? I, I don't know if that's true because all that ignores the whole gameplay issues that they're having, right? That that says, hey, 1.0 with destructible stuff and it looks pretty and I've got water running over the tanks and that's what he talks about up above before we get to this little section right here. Spends a lot of time talking about that. 
that's that's all good. And it, I would say that really does fall under the thing of, hey, you know, if we ask people what they wanted, they say a faster horse. If you, they ask players what they want, we say, hey, let's work on these gameplay problems that you've got. And then he's basically saying, no, you don't want that. What you really want is good graphics. <laughs> wow, man. Holy cow. All right, and so the, the last of it talks a lot about their reorganization, which is one of the reasons why it's probably not really in any of the World Tanks blogs where they talk about gameplay and things like that. But it really gets into, when you read it, it's interesting because it gets into the reorganization they've made. Essentially, the bottom line is the company got too big and unwieldy. Uh, lost focus, I think, in a lot of ways. They started to make several different games. The teams were stovepiped. They basically lived in their own world. What they've tried to do, from what I can read in here, is to reduce some of the fat. Remember I talked about last week that they had a fitness trainer? <laughs> that kind of thing. Pretty typical about a company that grows beyond its capability and then has to cut back. The problem is, usually when you do that, you lose a little bit of your soul while, while you're cutting, cutting away right there. It's hard to be agile and quick and swift when you're working with something this big, this a game like this that's that's this large. So they're they're going to struggle to do that to a large extent. But that's what the rest of this talks about as we get in here. Uh, used to have a so-called functional structure where global development, global publishing, finance, and so on. That's interesting. That finance one right there because they really started to spread out into a lot of different things. So I think their focus just got big. Right, and, and the strategic piece of it was huge. That was the focus. Whether or not we were worried about gold rounds at the player level or overpowered tanks or that kind of, they didn't. They didn't care. Or even if they did care, the strategic view was so large that it was just completely covered up by that thing. They they needed the money to keep flowing. The way the money keeps flowing is you sell the next overpowered premium tank, and what that does to the player base, they don't care about too much. As long as it's not a complete revolution by the players, they're going to keep on trucking and selling their stuff. So a lot of the things we complain about not getting fixed and being ignored, you can really, in the context of, of all of this business side of it, you really get a good understanding of what's happening. And it gets to why did you need to reorganize? And it really just dives into the whole thing that getting too big and unwieldy, you've got to un, uh, reorganize. And I don't know if you've ever been in a large organization that reorganizes but it usually is shuffling the shuffling the chairs on the deck of the sinking titanic right the reorganization makes things all the chairs in a straight line or maybe now we're going to use a we're going to use a circle of chairs or whatever it is but it really doesn't change much of anything that's going on on the worker b level so it's it is interesting it gets down to why it took them one point or eight years to get out 1.0 and all that kind of thing and continues on world of warships talks about that talks about about master of orion some other things so if you're interested in the business side of wargaming and what they're doing take a look at that article it's actually kind of interesting well that is it for coffee talk on april fool's day slash easter my dogs decided to come over and irritate me so that must be the end of it plus i'm out of coffee at this point got one more drink or so so have a great easter or sunday whatever it is you're going to do we will see you next week on coffee talk later <laughs>